Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today we are going to talk about a chapter of the God Emperor's Adeptus Astartes, and perhaps a favored tool of the uppermost echelons of Imperial power the Minotaur's Chapter. They are a loyalist space marine chapter with several little oddities attached to them. They featured prominently in the War for Badab series, available on this channel of course, and they display a particular fascination with hunting down renegade space marine chapters. Oh, don't get me wrong, they'll happily engage the occasional heretic or chaos space marine force if they get the opportunity to do so, but their true passion appears to be to hunt down and punish those of the God Emperor's angels, who for one reason or another turned their backs upon their master. Be it ignorance, or malice, or even the good intentions with which the road to hell is so famously paved. The motivations do not matter to the Minotaurs, nor do the rationale of the renegades they hunt down. The only thing the Minotaurs care about is burying their spears in their breasts. This kind of goal-oriented attitude, as pertains to traitors of the Imperium, has obviously made the Minotaurs a very popular chapter in the higher echelons of Imperial governance, amongst the Inquisition and the High Lords of Terror, but not quite so much amongst the lower fighting orders, as the Minotaurs tend to view pretty much everyone with suspicion, and they very rarely, if ever, make any secrets of it. They can be, well, can be, they are abrasive, superior, and aloof. And they never expend so much as a shred of effort in trying to make friends. An attitude and a dedication to duty which the Minotaurs displayed in spades during the Badab War and the prosecution of the Maelstrom Warders, the Astral Claws foremost amongst them. And the sagacious amongst you will remember that a key reason for that particular conflict was because the Astral Claws kept pissing up the wrong tree the Tree of the High Lords of Terror, and the God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition, of course. And the Minotaurs have close ties to both of these organizations, but perhaps very unusually, even more so to the High Lords than they do to the Inquisition. Now, of course, it's entirely normal that when the High Lords order a chapter to go do something, that they obey. They are the highest, most authority within the entire Imperium, after all. But the Minotaurs seem to make it their personal business to show up whenever the High Lords need something exterminated. This zeal has garnered the Minotaurs chapter no small amount of favor. Not only is the chapter allowed to operate in a very unusual fashion, deploying the full 1,000 Battle Brothers during any given campaign, rather than spreading out into individual companies like most chapters, but they are also protected by an Edict of Silence. One of such potent authority that even the Inquisition cannot circumvent it rendering virtually every piece of information about the Minotaurs, their homeworld, their organization, their tactics, their recruitment traditions, etc., etc., matters of the highest confidence. This is, of course, a boon of tremendous value to an Astartes chapter, as all Astartes chapter value their independence and none can claim to be quite so independent as the Minotaurs. 
though it bears mentioning that it is unclear whether the Minotaurs received this favor as a reward for services rendered, or if the Minotaurs were specifically created to carry out these services, and thus requiring the obfuscation of the High Lords, lest the Inquisition try to steal their toys. Or purge them, for there may be a reason beyond simple favor that sees the Minotaurs be given their special privileges. And to find that reason, and to begin to explain whether the Minotaur's special privileges are a boon or a necessity, we need to go back to the origins of the Minotaur's chapter. Origins that are not merely mysterious, but of course secret. This is obviously going to further complicate matters of finding out who or what the Minotaurs are. So let's begin by laying out what we know. Well, it appears to be, curiously so, for a chapter protected by such a strict edict of silence, to be no doubt and a matter of imperial record, that a chapter of imperial space marines were created during the 21st founding in the waning days of the 35th millennium. Now, many amongst you, of course, already know that this particular founding had a second name as well. The Cursed Founding. One we have referred to on more than one occasion, and very rarely in a positive light. And to yet further complicate and spookify matters, there are records of an Astartes chapter fitting the description of the Minotaurs in terms of paraphernalia, general color scheme and tactics, hailing back to the 32nd millennium, four thousand years in essence before their actual creation. Now, of course, this could be easily enough explained as a simple mistake. To the eyes of a mortal, after all, one space marine is much the same as another. But the idea of bronze-armored space marines operating in the 32nd millennium well, that's a very interesting data point when taken into consideration with another piece of the puzzle. Namely, that the progenitor chapter of the Minotaurs were never revealed, nor was the nature of their gene seed or their gene sire. Now, this in and of itself would hardly make the Minotaurs unique. But what does make them very peculiar indeed is the fact that the only remaining documentation even mentioning their gene seed specifies it as chimeric. And in the case of space marine gene seed, that can only really mean one thing. That the Minotaurs don't have one Primarch, they have two. Now there's a dangerous idea, certainly fitting for the cursed founding, but despite the unorthodox nature of their creation, presumably at least, the Minotaurs remained a loyal chapter for a significant amount of time, serving the Imperium faithfully and partaking even in a Black Crusade on the defending side, of course, in the 37th millennium, before mysteriously disappearing in the 38th millennium. This is also where the first signs of the Edict of Silence can be easily detected, in that there are several records that were once available that have now since been purged. And since, of course, an entire Astartes chapter leaves a pretty hefty footprint, the simple fact that no word was heard of them until the 41st millennium, when they reappeared, 
is indicative of the fact that either the Minotaurs must have been practically destroyed and then rebuilt over the course of millennia, or someone covered them up for a very long time. And that kind of power, again, can probably only be found at the very top of the Imperial Palace back on Terra. So, with these scattered bits and pieces of information, what can we learn? Well, my theory is as follows. The earliest mentions of the Minotaurs are probably correct, at least in part, as in that they are referencing some form of Astartes chapter that use the iconography of the Minotaurs and that conceivably eventually became the Minotaurs. So who could these warriors have been? Well, it seems extremely unlikely that they were members of one of the Loyalist legions, as they would almost certainly have returned to their legions or chapters after the Horus Heresy, which leaves the potential for traitor legionnaires. But these were operating in defense of the Imperium, so how could that be? Well, there were a fair few Astartes that turned against their legions, on both sides of the conflict, incidentally. But this in and of itself doesn't really narrow it down much, now does it? So what other characteristics do we know about the Minotaurs? Well, we know that they were more often than not described as berserkers and extremely aggressive on the assault. So what have we got? Bronze armor a bestial icon and heraldry, and extreme berserk aggression. Well, we've got a legion that fits that description, don't we? The Warhounds. The first founding legion that would eventually be turned into the World Eaters by Angron. Now, admittedly, a similarity in tactics and general color schematics is not exactly an ironclad link. And it does somewhat stretch credulity, doesn't it, that a splinter force of warhounds, or world eaters, would remain sane enough to keep themselves alive all the way up until the cursed founding, especially considering their uh, wild tactics and the fact that they must have been low in numbers to begin with. But perhaps they didn't have to remain alive. Perhaps it would be enough for one or two individuals or even simply just a sample of them to remain intact up until that point. Perhaps the sighting of the Minotaur's chapter in the 32nd millennium was merely the last remnants of a Warhound's warband, who were soon thereafter destroyed for whatever reason, probably throwing themselves at some heavy bolter emplacements if their usual proclivities are any indication, and their bodies were stored away in some deep, dark, Magos Biologist archives somewhere, until during the cursed founding, someone decided it would be a brilliant idea to see what would happen if one would combine Warhound's gene seed with something more controlled. For it is absolutely true that despite the fact that the Minotaurs are still a rather rowdy chapter today, they are no longer at least pure berserk savages. So something must clearly have been introduced to water down their more extreme tendencies. Personally, and I base this on not a whole lot honestly, I would say Death Guard. Partially because it would certainly provide a fine counterbalance to the chloric temper of the Warhounds, and partially because the Minotaur's chapter master, Asterion Moloch, 
and survived some shit that surely only a death guard could possibly survive. We're talking going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the master of a Necron dynasty here, defeating him, getting heavily wounded in the process, and then vented out into space in a broken suit of power armor, and living to tell the tale. That kind of survival. And whilst this is, of course, quite speculatory, I believe the idea that the Minotaurs might be a mix of Warhounds and Death Guard explains quite a lot, including why they were pulled out of the Imperium for quite some time. So clearly, the Minotaurs performed fairly well after their founding in the Cursed Founding. They remained loyal, and they remained effective, but... Their warhound tendencies were overpowering their death guard sensibilities. <laughs> if you could refer to that as sensibilities, that is. And the chapter was probably headed towards an early death after only a thousand five hundred years of service. But seeing as the mix of death guard and warhound was proving effective and apparently stable, someone probably had the bright idea to fiddle with them just a little bit further to see what could be done with them. And it clearly wasn't a simple process, as the Minotaur chapter, again as mentioned, disappeared in the middle of the 38th millennium, and only reappeared in the middle of the 41st millennium. Now the time discrepancy in and of itself could be explained by them simply going off the radar, heading out to the fringes of the galaxy, or even possibly being lost in a warp storm. That is possible, but their change in temperament and tactic cannot be so easily explained. Because when they did re-emerge, they were a very different chapter. They still possessed no shortage of savagery, definitely, and they were still a heavily close quarters focus shock chapter. But they now also began to demonstrate a skill in grinding, exhausting warfare, which they displayed so readily and so effectively during the war for Badal. Whatever happened during those thousands of years of missing in action, the Minotaurs clearly learned a lot of lessons during that time and clearly got a far better grip on their temperament during that time. And I doubt it was something so simple as sitting down and reading the Codex Astartes for 4,000 years. What I would imagine happened was that the High Lords, or someone with equivalent authority, or one of them, took notice of the chapter and decided that this would be a brilliant opportunity to not only carry out a significant experiment, but to also keep in action a very effective force of Astartes directly under the control of the High Lords of Terra. Because of course if my speculations are correct, and that they are indeed a mix of two traitor legions, then the Minotaurs themselves would undoubtedly face strict censorship and probably outright excommunication from the Inquisition if that fact should ever become known. Thus, the Minotaurs are not only indebted to the High Lords of Terra for aiding them in their darkest hour and curing them, somewhat, sort of, kinda, of their maledictions, but they also can't betray the High Lords, lest the Minotaurs themselves be purged. The perfect mix of gratitude and blackmail. Now that sounds like something the High Lords would do. But hey, being the favoured pets of the High Lords of Terra, do not only come with demerits, 
In fact, there are significant advantages to having friends in such high places. We've already mentioned the fact that the Minotaur's chapter is not only able, but allowed to move in full chapter strength. A privilege usually withheld from many chapters for the simple reason that, by and large, a company of space marines is more than enough to deal with most problems, and the Imperium is not allowed the leisure of wasting its forces on massive overkill. Yet the Minotaurs are with no apparent sign of censor, as this is their preferred method of deployment. Other than this, however, the chapter is mostly Codex Astartes compliant, in terms of the organization of their squads and their companies. The only other major deviation comes in the chapter's armories. As wherever the Minotaurs were during their lengthy absence, they were most certainly raised right in the environment, with more than just a silver spoon or two, but an entire cutlery set made out of very noble metals indeed, as the chapter's armory is abundant in the extreme. With the Minotaurs able to easily field massed formations of battle tanks, with Vindicators and Predators so plentiful that they are often assigned to individual tactical squads for close-in support. This is a level of luxuriousness when it comes to armor that nearly no other chapter could possibly match. Even the Iron Hands would look enviously upon the sheer quantity of armor in the Minotaur's arsenal. And it doesn't merely stop with vehicles either. The entire first company of the Terminator's chapter can deploy on the field of battle in Terminator armor should they so choose. This is rare enough for founding chapters of the original legions, never mind successors, and certainly never mind 26th founding chapters. Space Marines formations this far down the hereditary line would usually be lucky if they could employ a single squad of Terminators as the Chapter Master's bodyguards, and yet the Minotaurs can deploy an entire company of them. And not stopping there, their sergeants usually carry the finest power weapons or storm bolters, along with the seemingly infinite supply of exotic specialized weaponry, like plasma weapons, plasma cannons, heavy multi-melters, whatever the chapter seems to need, they are given ten times over. And if it was merely about an abundance of supplies, then that too could be explained. Perhaps the chapter saved some forge world in an ancient past. Perhaps there are bonds of fealty and loyalty to that forge world that they still possess today. Perhaps their home planet is a forge world, which would be exceptionally rare to the point of being virtually unique, but plausible, right? But no, it isn't merely the quantity of the gear, it is the age and the quality of it as well. As not only do they boast things like predators and vindicators and whirlwinds aplenty, they even possess things as storm eagle gunships and spartan assault tanks. These were things that were considered standard issue during the Great Crusade. And yet, here they are, present in full phalanxes in the Minotaur's chapter. Again, a 21st founding chapter. This suggests a far, far older lineage than the chapter admits to. And to further hammer home this point as well, there is another piece of ancient kit found in the Minotaur's armory in significant numbers. Dreadnoughts. But not just any dreadnoughts, contemptor pattern dreadnoughts. Yet again, standard issue during the Great Crusade. But certainly not today, and weirder still is the way that the chapter behaves towards these dreadnoughts. Now in any other chapter, a dreadnought is viewed as a venerable ancient, 
someone possessed of tremendous wisdom and enormous moral authority. They are practically the ancestral deities of most chapters, and yet the Minotaurs treat theirs with what could only be described as the cousin of disdain. It's not that they don't respect them, they do to a degree, and it's not even that they don't venerate them, obviously they do, they are dreadnoughts, they will require tremendous quantities of maintenance and care to be kept operational, and yet they do not treat them with any sort of reverence, any sort of favour, if that makes sense. As again, in most other chapters, a dreadnought would be a banner, an icon, a sign of a long-lost glorious age, and yet the Minotaurs couldn't care less about theirs. Now, this could have something to do with the fact that the Minotaurs are not overly concerned about casualties at the best of days, but contemptor pattern dreadnoughts tend to be reserved for special cases, particularly ancient individuals or those of uniquely exceptional actions or service, perhaps even original members of the chapter? Perhaps even some that are viewed today with deep hostility and suspicion, like, oh, I don't know, Berserk Warhounds? <laughs> now, there is also another potential explanation for this. The most likely one is obviously that they are the favoured pets of the High Lords and thus have access to the finest things that the Imperium has to offer. But there is another possibility as well. You see, the Minotaurs display consistently an absolute and utter disregard for their allies, not merely bordering on insubordination or rudeness, but actively entering into the territory of antagonizing their allies. There are several recorded instances of the Minotaurs deliberately going out of their way to insult allies, either directly or indirectly. For example, during the war for Badav, Asterian Moloch, the chapter master, never once attended a war council meeting, not a single solitary time, instead sending his representative, the Reclusiarch Ivanus Inkumi, to speak on his behalf, a chaplain. That in and of itself is a little bit of a hidden insult, seemingly suggesting that Whomever else is silly enough to waste their time on dumb meetings when there is a war to win could require a quick sermon and a reminder from the true faithfuls of the Imperium. This antagonistic attitude towards their allies could then go some length to explain why they have such abundant armories. After all, if they go out of their way to antagonize other space marines, and their favorite tactics is complete surrounds and annihilation of their enemies, well, all I'm saying is, if your enemy is dead, he no longer needs his war gear, regardless of who aforementioned enemy might once have been. And this is certainly how they recruit. The Minotaurs care not a great deal for their own losses, as they are able to replenish their ranks remarkably swiftly, using a highly... Um, controversial... <laughs> system of psychological indoctrination and ways of speeding up the transformation process of a neophyte into an Astartes. Most chapters would consider this to be extraordinarily dangerous because it takes a very long time to raise a neophyte. First he must be discovered, of course, then he must be trained and hardened for years, then he must serve alongside the other scouts as he learns everything there is to know about how the chapter operates, its tactics, its ways of waging war, its traditions, etc., etc., before finally being elevated to the 
rank of a battle brother as a great honor. The Minotaurs don't really care for scouts. They have very little need of them, frankly. And when they do conduct reconnaissance, it's usually in the form of an armored spearhead. And so their scout formations are really only employed as further assistance to their rapid moving spearheads. And scouts are elevated to the ranks of full battle brother as soon as they are able to take on the final surgeries and the implementation of the Black Carapace. Undoubtedly, the numbers of neophytes that fail their uh, indoctrination, either due to errors in the psycho-indoctrination, or inadequate preparation for their surgeries, or who are simply not given the time to mature, are probably quite significant and staggering. But the Minotaurs have no shortage of new recruits, so who cares if their casualty percentages are a little bit high? This suggests that they either have a very productive recruitment world, or, more likely, again as seen with Badab, that they recruit from the conquered population of those they purge. In essence, raiding the recruitment worlds of the Astartes that they defeat in order to replenish their own ranks. And this is absolutely a necessary course of action for the Minotaurs as well, as I mentioned previously that before the Minotaurs possessed a certain berserk abandon. They would simply hurl themselves at the enemy, wanting to overwhelm them as swiftly and as brutally as possible before moving on to the next target. The fight itself was in essence a greater objective than the victory, and so long as the Minotaurs could get to grip with the enemy, then everything else was largely immaterial. And yet the Minotaurs of today have changed tact completely, utilizing instead large strategic moving armored spearheads to circumnavigate their enemies' positions whilst fixing them in place with shock assault troops, allowing them to surround and destroy large pockets of enemy resistance piece by piece. And they are willing to do this however many times it takes. They are willing to do this not only on a tactical scale, as in a single engagement either, but on a full strategic level, planet by planet, battle by battle, as every single step in the lengthy campaign culminates in the destruction, the whole scale annihilation of another cluster of enemies. This combination has resulted in an interesting form of both steady and attritional combat, where the Minotaurs know full well that they are more than able to outlast nearly any foe, but it is also combined with the shock assault tactics and the rapid movement of more aggressive chapters. Once more, a perfect mix of Warhound and Death Guard, along with a generous armory have made the Minotaurs extraordinarily effective, and better yet, it has made them into the kind of fighting force that don't leave enemies behind. When the Minotaurs pass through an area, there won't be anything for their allies to mop up. And that's probably a very good thing indeed, as, again, the Minotaurs have a very hard time cooperating with others. And when I say that, I, I really do mean it. We've talked about chapters before that don't get along with their allies. For example, the poor Marines Malevolent, those most misunderstood of Space Marine chapters. They merely wish to do what is best for the Imperium, and they don't really care how others view them as they carry out their god-emperor-given honorable duty. The Minotaurs don't act like that at all. They go out of their way to insult allies, to the point of frequently coming to blows with them, as if they hate them almost as much as they hate the enemy. And hey, 
If you happen to hail from what would largely be considered to be traitor legions, you might have a rather harsh view on loyalist chapters. But, by and large, their masters are able to keep a tight enough rein on the Minotaurs, to the point where there is absolutely no indication whatsoever that they are disloyal in any way. In fact, they might be amongst the most loyal chapters in the entirety of the Imperium. It's just that their loyalty is less to the concept of the Imperium and less still to its populace or its other armed forces and more to the rulers of the Imperium. In this way, the Minotaur's cold, calculating and often dismissive way of waging war is quite reminiscent of the Imperium itself. It is a machine. A great, grinding, crushing, monstrous creation that cares not one iota if it grinds to dust beneath its threads civilians or enemies, Xenos or Astartes, renegades, heretics, it matters not. If they've picked up a weapon against the Imperium, that is all that truly matters. And the Minotaurs will make damn sure that they never make such a silly mistake ever again. This, incidentally, is also why the fate of the Lamenters is so remarkable. Sure, the Minotaurs killed the overwhelming majority of them in a long, drawn-out series of unfathomably bloody battles, but hey, that's just Tuesday for the Lamenters. Nothing particularly out of the ordinary at all. <laughs> and sure, the Minotaurs also made off with the chapter's entire armory as well, but they let them live. Indicating that the Minotaurs must clearly have found something noteworthy and admirable in the Lamenters. Enough so as to stay their spears when, on any other occasion, they would have undoubtedly run red with the rich arterial blood of space marines. And with that final optimistic note, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I do hope to see all of you again soon. Till then, have a good day.